Genesis chapter 24. All right. There is a lot of rich pictures here with the Christian church and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and God the Father with Isaac, Rebecca, and Abraham. All good things must come to an end. I had a very good time. One day I would like to do a pure teaching just on Christian nuggets in Genesis. I would love to do that. But Genesis chapter 24 is undoubtedly the richest one. We had fun at Genesis chapter 23, which talked about Sarah representing the first wife. So she is Israel. However, she is put aside, and then Rebecca became the focal point and attention. So this is the new mother that the Lord is concentrating on, the new woman that the Lord is concentrating on, and that is the church. And as you already know, God put aside Israel temporarily and partially, and the Lord started to put his operation and emphasis on the Christian church. Genesis chapter 22, followed in perfect sequence, it talked about Isaac being offered as a lamb, sacrifice, but God used a ram, not a lamb, which is very interesting, and I explained to you why. It's a fulfillment of Scripture. That's the reason why, that God will provide himself a lamb, not God will provide a lamb for himself. So in order to fulfill that prophecy, that's the reason why he gave a ram, not a lamb, because Abraham was prophesying about Jesus Christ himself. So we had a great picture of salvation, Jesus dying on the cross, Genesis 22, Genesis 23, Israel is being uh, gradually put aside and then later on temporarily, partially cast aside. Then Genesis 24, the focus of the attention is now on the Gentiles. And then we covered a lot of Gentile wording and pictures here at Genesis 24, which is 10. And then we also covered uh, lots of other details, which is very interesting. Now we're going to wrap it up with the last couple of pictures in Genesis 24, how Rebecca pictures the church. In verse 63, I commented on this, so I'll briefly explain it. And remember, I will literally explain every single word because people nowadays are saying that the King James Bible is hard to understand. Well, no, it's like every other subject, like I told you, in every other book that you read. At the beginning, you're not familiar with the wording and the text, but once you start studying, actually studying, not just lazily looking at a picture screen, if you actually study and then attend church where they teach you the Bible correctly, then what happens is you kind of get this common sense gist of the reading, and then eventually, especially with your own Bible reading, Bible studying, and then attending a Bible-believing church with a Bible-believing teacher and preacher, then you get the common sense gist, and then it comes to you. And when I explain literally word for word, unconsciously in your mind, you'll automatically explain it yourself before I explain it. That's what you're going to catch yourself a lot of times. I pretty much guarantee that nearly every one of you have, has done that if you've been to our Genesis studies for a long time, that there are some passages when I explained it, you already explained it to yourself. All right, Genesis chapter 24. Here we go. I'm going to explain every word. Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. So in other words, Isaac, he went out to the field, and this was during evening, and he was meditating. And I've explained what was going on and the rich nuggets behind that last chance to study. Then uh, as he uh, woke up, from, uh, as he finished his meditation, then he lifted up his eye. See that? So he's going like this. Then lo and behold, that's the idea. He saw a bunch of camels coming toward him. He was meditating about this for a while. He was waiting for Eliezer to come with the caravan. Finally, they came. Verse 64, and Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel, meaning that Rebekah herself also lifted up her eyes. So her eyes saw Isaac, then she got off the camel. That's the idea about lighted off the camel. Now, there's a joke, which I think is not really a funny joke. It's kind of a lame joke. 
but you know, it's for smoking lighting off the camel, you know? So that's what pastors use. I feel like that's kind of lame, you know? It's, it's not that funny, you know? It's like, you know, they give a joke about, uh, you know where they talk about coffee in the Bible? He brews, so he yeah. brew the coffee, you know? That's, yeah, the shortest guy in the Bible, shortest guy in the Bible, Bildad the shoe height, you know? So shoe level. <laughs> so one sister thinks it's funny, so. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sure Bill Dad up in heaven appreciates that joke, you know. Yeah. <laughs> He's probably Max's height too, you know. <laughs> All right, yeah. so. Verse 65. For she had said unto the servant, One man is this that walketh in the field to meet us. So it's explaining right here that she lighted off the camel. Why? Because she already beforehand asked the servant, said to him, who is the man, who is this guy that's walking in the field heading toward us to meet us? And the servant had said, it is my master. So Eliezer, the servant, answered her, uh, the person that you're seeing, it's my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself. That's why when she heard that it was her, uh, bright, uh, it was her groom, her husband-to-be, she took a veil, like uh, brides do. Sometimes they'll have a veil and they'll cover themselves. Now, there's a significance behind this, why they do this in wedding ceremonies, for some of you who don't know. In the past, uh, what, let me see what to write over here. So let's put Genesis in this one side. And we are comparing, as I mentioned to you before, the Christian church, so we will put Christian picture. All right, so I'm too lazy to write pictures, so I'll just draw a picture right here and people will understand, I guess. <laughs> All right, so then this is a Christian picture and then this is Genesis right here. Here's one nugget that we see. Let me know if I'm, uh, the words are cut out of bounds. So veil, why do they cover themselves with the veil? Why would the bride cover herself with the veil? The meaning behind that is because it's to show that her exposure, so to speak, because she's hiding her beauty, right? That's why the face is mostly concentrated. But the idea is that all of herself, her beauty, that it's saved for her husband. So she reveals all of herself, her beauty, to the one she marries, but then everything else, uh, everyone else out there, she kept herself pure and hidden from that. So the idea is sometimes people will include virginity right here, sometimes they'll include their purity right here, but the point is that she maintains uh, herself, everything of herself for the husband, untainted by the world. She's covered and hidden, protected from the world. We're going to look at some passages here. Look at Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 5. We can obviously compare with the Christian church. It's very obvious. You can guess it yourself without me explaining. The Christian church is the bride of Jesus Christ. And as the bride of Jesus Christ... We are to be untainted in this world. And we are to keep ourselves pure and our exposure and our revealing of ourselves is only to Jesus Christ, not to this wicked world. Now look at Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Song of Solomon, chapter 5. The picture of Genesis matches well with the picture in Song of Solomon. Solomon rep pictures Jesus Christ and then the woman here, pictures the church. Notice that she had a veil at verse 7. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took away my veil from me. Uh, now I want you to look at the book of Matthew chapter, I think it's 13. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And then we'll look at verse 45. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 45. 
We'll start off at verse 44 by context. 44 by context. Notice that the bride or the Christian church, that they have been hidden or basically lost, but then when they've been found and discovered, all of its revealing and exposure is saved for the Son, saved for Jesus Christ. Now, 44 is referring to Israel, but uh, let me just build up the context with 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto the treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth the field. So this is supposed to picture where God finds uh, the Jews, Israel. That's the idea with the treasure. The treasure is Israel. But notice that he hideth it, right? But in our case, verse 45, which is the pearl, that's supposed to be the Christian church. It's not supposed to be solely Israel itself. Notice that when we're lost or hidden, that God doesn't hide it again. He actually uh, buys it. He actually makes sure that it's exposed and revealed solely for himself. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, that's the Christian church, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So notice right here, he found this pearl. This pearl that was lost, hidden, or undisclosed, it was actually now exposed, revealed for that rich man who bought the pearl. And that's the church being revealed and bought by Jesus Christ. Let's compare now with 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. With scripture, with scripture, you can see all of this building up. So the Christian church, they're covered themselves. Covered from the world. And their revealing and their exposure is saved, given to Jesus Christ. Right. To their groom. You might say, is that scriptural? Yes, because notice that Christians nowadays, that they don't protect their purity. Right. And, I don't, and, you know, that could go spiritually and physically. That's that. That's the kind of day and generation we live in today. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, focusing on the spiritual part, we expose ourselves to this wicked world, to the flesh. How many have you exposed yourself to sin in the mind, the heart? And uh, basically, there are even pastors exposing themselves. You know, I don't have to post a video, Joel Osteen exposed. He exposed himself. He exposed his wickedness, his compromise, his apostasy already. I'm just being more honest than him. He won't say it. I'll say it for him. Joel Eckstein exposed, all right? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Notice that your purity is maintained for Jesus Christ. So Paul is jealous that when he uh, espoused them to that one husband, they ruined it. Notice that this ruin is explained at verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguile these through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Notice that you have been tainted, corrupted by Satan. Yes, you should be covered because at your wedding day, you will or you won't. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Notice that the bride of the Lamb that she is covered herself. She is covered with her own righteousness. So your righteousness, the way you live as a Christian, counts for your covering where you can show your purity to Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. See, you got your wedding day coming. And his wife hath made herself ready. Are you ready, bride? Verse 8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. See, she's covered in her own bride, bridal apparel. For the fine linen is the what? Righteousness of saints. 
Notice right here, your own righteousness counts. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we'll close it finally over here. Look at Revelation chapter 3. This is the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, God judges your righteous works and your deeds. And depending how well your works are, up goes your rewards, gold, silver, precious stones, and up goes your clothing too. What does that mean? That means there's going to be some naked Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Isn't that America today? Laodicean Christians? Fits us to a T. Okay, if this fits very well with us, what can we learn from this? And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and what? Naked. There are going to be naked Christians. 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. See, that's that fire at the judgment seat of Christ where your gold is tried. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Notice that it's white raiment. That's why the bride is dressed in white. You ever wondered that? You ever wondered why a bunch of these liberals who get married at weddings that the liberal lady is not liberal friendly and color tolerant, that she would have a rainbow for her wedding dress? Yeah. Why? Because she knows deep down in her unconscious mind right there that there's something special about that color white. And hey, what a bunch of racists subconsciously, these yeah. liberal women. All right? Change it to a rainbow, man. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Genesis 24. Genesis chapter... 24. Amen. So are you naked, Christians? Now, notice at Genesis 24, remember I told you that this scenery is where the church meets Jesus at the rapture. I told you that, right? I've already explained that at verse 63, last Genesis study. And I've also explained that at uh, verse 61 and 62. So let me explain again. The idea is, remember, that the Christian church is going through a long journey on their home to heaven. That's what the camels represent. The number 10 represented that I explained everything that has to do with times of Gentiles and everything else. As we go through this journey, then we meet Jesus Christ finally, and Jesus Christ receives his bride. But when he receives his bride, will the bride then, at verse 65, be clothed? See, she was ready. Revelation 19 said the wife hath made herself ready when the, when the sun comes. When the sun comes right here, she made herself ready with her clothing. Are you? Are you butt naked? Okay. Are you ready? Do you cover yourself? Okay, verse 66. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. So Rebekah meets Isaac, covering herself, and then Eliezer, the servant, tells Isaac everything that uh, he did and what happened and the story that occurred. Isn't this awesome? What's awesome is if Eliezer represents the Holy Spirit, the servant represents the Holy Spirit, which I already explained before, right? So if Eliezer... tells the son, and this is Isaac right here, notice that the Holy Spirit is also going to tell the son everything that happened. What's the idea here? So, at the judgment seat of Christ, you got that Holy Spirit in you, and then... When you meet the Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit gives a report of everything that happened and what he did when he was operating on that child of God or the bride. Oh, yeah, I convicted them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They drowned it out with sin or the flesh. They just uh, were too lazy and couldn't go to church, couldn't read the Bible, pray. They had a billion excuses, and that's what's going to happen. That's going to happen. But here's the positive side. I don't want to 
end it with a negative side. It's more of a positive side to this passage. Go to Romans 14. Romans 14. The positive side, can you imagine? So remember, we are at the timeline of Genesis 24 right now. This is a timeline where the Holy Spirit's at work here while the son is waiting for the bride. So the focal attention is actually the work and the activity is not the Son, Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit right now. So the Holy Spirit has been at work for 2,000 years helping that bride through her journey riding along the camels during the number 10, during the times of the Gentiles. Yeah. And imagine, man, you thought that you would run and shout reading those church history books from Dr. Uckman or those life and ministry booklets uh, from Reese where it talks about every missionary, every martyr who burned at the stake, uh, the protection, the preservation of, those, uh, of the King James Bible and the manuscripts behind it, memorized by those fatwas, Waldensians and ancient Baptists. And then you see these little children street preaching, I think around 8 to 10 during the time of the Inquisition. And then we're Christians during this day and age where the Antichrist is about to set up his government and one world government system and United Nations and everything, how that the Holy Spirit is still at work in Bible-believing churches where they're holding the fort taking their last stand and fighting to the teeth and still seeing souls get saved, still seeing believers getting on the altar, repenting, getting right with God, still seeing churches running and operating and open, missions still being supported, operating and running. Woo, man, imagine the Holy Spirit tells all of that. Man, it gets you running the aisles. Get you running the aisles. I mean, when I read Dr. Upman's church history book, it just gets my blood pumping. And that's the reason why I told you that my masterpiece teaching is actually not those deep doctrines or anything eschatological or verse-by-verse -verse studies, especially Revelation. It's not those. My masterpiece was history of Bible believers. And I showed you for the past 2,000 years, including the timeline of now, and it gets you all, start, it gets you all started up, right? That's why I teach it once every year or once every two years. I should teach it again real soon. Yeah. Yes. But how that all came together is it's a condensed version of Dr. Upman's church history book and the life and work uh, pamphlets, tracts, and booklets I've been reading from other authors. It's just so incredible. The missionaries to the cannibals, like uh, his converts would street preach all night long while these cannibals had their party all night long. And then the missionary was sleeping while his convert was still street preaching. And then the missionary got up and he said, have you been at it all night? And then the convert said, Pastor, I've, been, I've talked about Genesis, creation, and I've talked about uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, and King David. I'm about to talk about the story of Jesus. I can't stop now. And then he kept street preaching. I mean, stuff like that. And these missionaries, they died on the mission field. Missionaries who were eaten up by cannibals, Missionaries who died and they literally had their heart cut off and left and buried in that field. Missionaries who died on the field, didn't get a convert saved, but then some convert like years later would come to their spot, find the Bible that they had, read it, and get saved after that. Missionaries like uh, you wouldn't see so much fruit where you'd see a missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, and then at the beginning, it was so much struggle and it was a hard work. But after he died, communism came in. And then the Chinese communists uh, told uh, one of their authors, one of their popular authors they relied upon, I want you to take Hudson Taylor's work and critique everything that he does. He reads it. He gets saved instead. Yes. You know, you get this, uh, the man, brother, sister in Christ, if Gene Kim got you riled up, got you excited just by this portion and if you got uh, so excited with Dr. Upman telling you that kind of stuff, let me tell you something. Wait till God, the Holy Spirit, yeah. speaks to yeah. you and you can't help but go, wow, glory. Amen, Man, you talk about 50 times blowout King James Jubilee revival is hyped up. Yeah. Man, that would be something. What a day, man. Yeah. What a day. Gene Kim only scratched the surface of what he told you. I mean, that verse go, I have not seen and ear heard. Man, 
All right. Makes you wonder if I have not seen God might, the Holy Spirit might just even show you to, right. not just yeah. speak it. Oh, man, man. man, somebody want to run around the room or something? Man, <laughs> man, that's going to be something. The Holy Spirit's going to tell everything to Jesus Christ. This is what's been going on yeah. for the past 2,000 years. All right. I mean, like I told you before, it's, uh, I wouldn't trade being a Bible-believing Christian yeah. for all, everything in this world. Everything in world history, empires have risen and fell away. It's always temporal vainglory, right. and that's what the world is doing right now. It's temporary vainglory. Guess what? It's going to rise and fall. Rise and fall. But Christianity went oh. on. It went on for 2,000 years. Amen. That's just something. What endured and preserved is not just that King James Bible. It's God's church. Yeah. That's something, man. God has to rapture somebody right. before the tribulation. Right. So his church will march on. Okay, uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 10, by context. Verse 10, by context. By, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Imagine at the judgment seat of Christ, where you give an account of yourself, and the Holy Spirit was your guide all that time. Sure, I know there's terror, but man, what glory to. Yeah. Man, what glory to. See, uh, uh, there's one story account. I think he was eight or six or something like that. I, I think it was somewhere between six to nine. But uh, this child tells his account at the judgment seat of Christ. True story that uh, he went to visit his father in prison. This was uh, during the time of the Dark Ages, the Catholic Inquisition. And then uh, one of the religious leaders said, Why, thy father is a heretic. And then the six to nine-year-old replied to him, no, uh, my father is no heretic. You are a heretic for you have Balaam's mark. <laughs> and they beat up that child, man. Yeah. They beat up that child. And that child says, that's my report at the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. Whoo, man, we be uh, running and shouting. And then when Joel Osteen comes up, all right, tell us your story. Yawn. <laughs> Yawn. Yeah. Yawn. And sadly, even Bible-believing Christians nowadays, okay. yawn, okay. yawn. How long have you been in this church and you can't deny that we've seen too much already? Yeah. It's quite a story, man. Uh, you saw at the blowout with testimonies. <laughs> that got you stirred up? Come on, that, that's the one that Pastor Dennis Knowles appreciated the most more than the other preachers? Come on, man, imagine the Holy Spirit. <laughs> man, isn't that powerful? Why do I say all this? I'm telling you how valuable it is to live your life as a Christian. Your testimony is more worth than a million dollars. Okay? All right. Enough of that. Let's go to Genesis 24. I could preach on that for an hour. Okay, let's go to Genesis 24. Man, that was, that was good stuff at Genesis 24, 66, right? I like to show you all uh, something right here. It, uh, I don't know if there's a pattern here to what the Holy Spirit's moving, but it says 66. That's when the Bible ends with 66 book. So maybe the Lord, he wraps up everything and tells everything that he does at a close. All right. Look at verse 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. So it's self-explanatory. Self -explanatory. Isaac brings uh, Rebecca inside his mother's tent. So his mother, Sarah, who passed away, had her own tent. Isaac uh, took Rebecca inside there. And at that time, Rebecca instantly became uh, Isaac's wife. So this passage shows that Genesis chapter 24, verse 67, that when flesh joins flesh, that's when God automatically considers a marriage. So it's not limited to a certificate. Now, I'm not saying do things illegally, obviously. There are passages that shows that you have to do things lawfully, actually. And 1 Corinthians 7 is one of them. However, the idea is we live in a spoil-rotten generation where Americans think as long as I have a certificate, 
then flesh can join flesh with however much I want to during my college years before I get married. That's why some people dread marriage. Isn't that insane? Yeah. That's insane. You know, uh, when I had some people here who learned that flesh joining flesh was marriage, when they learned that and heard about that from me, they got more under conviction with how they played around with sex, so to speak, and had been more careful. Because how many sex and divorce and remarriages okay. have people went through already? Man, it's insane. It's insane. Okay. Anyways, at verse 67, the passage shows another picture. Sarah's replaced. Notice Isaac's love for Sarah. The last part says he was comforted after his mother's death, right? You see that? So Sarah, the first love, has been replaced by this new love, Rebecca. There's no doubt about that, we see. We see right here that Israel, that they have been replaced by the Christian church. The love has been replaced. God cast aside the first love and then found new love right here. Now, I get nitpicky trolls, and they'll probably, uh, knowing how trolls are, they'll probably commit and do a video on this one. Look, I don't care, you know. Uh, I, I'm so used to it by now, I don't care anymore. But obviously, I do not believe in replacement theology, okay? So th that teaching is that basically Israel has been replaced by the church, so then all the promises are to Israel are applied to the church. Wait, pastor, you said that the church replaced Israel, so aren't you, what do you mean you don't teach replacement theology? The idea is this, the replacement has been only uh, been spiritual. We don't replace its physical promises. Right. Secondly, it's, tempo it's temporal, temporary. Yep. So it's not a permanent replacement. So God's promises, what he gave to Israel, has to be restored in the future. Yep. That's why we call it restoration right, yeah. of Israel, because they've been put aside, then restored. Thirdly, thirdly, it's only partially, yeah. because there are some promises that God gave to the Jews that even though he cast them aside, some of them are still operating, actually. Yep. Some of them are still operating. So it's only partially. So we'll look at Romans 11 to explain all of this, okay? We'll look at Romans 11 to explain all of this. Notice that Sarah's residency, where she was at, the tent, where she was at, her place, was basically replaced by Rebecca. Rebecca went to her place. Now look how this matches very well with Romans 11. Look at this. Romans chapter 11. The Bible says in verse 12, Now if the fall of them, that's the Jews, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Look at right here in verse 17, And if some of the branches be broken off, see, notice that Israel has been broken off. And thou being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them. See that? And with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Notice right here that you are the olive tree, the Gentiles. And they took the place where the Jews were originally at. So notice that the church replaced Israel, went to their place. Oh, so you believe in replacement theology. No, because look at verse 19. That will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And look at verse 21. For if God spare not the natural branches, Israel, Jews, take heed lest he also not spare thee, Gentiles. And is that true? Oh, yeah, you're seeing it. Gentiles have been casting aside God, so God's about to... Uh, cast them off and go back to the Jews. 
Look at verse 23. See, this is totally not replacement theology. Verse 23, And they also, uh, the Jews, if they abide not still in unbelief, see, when they go back to believing, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in what? Again, see, they go, God goes back to the Jews again. Now, look at this partial temporal replacement at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Don't be ignorant right. and post videos and be stupid and say, Gene Kim teaches replacement theology. Don't be ignorant, fool. Right. Look at right here. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceit. Don't be conceited. That's what internet, a YouTube channel, oh. Facebook, blog, social media posts are like. All arrogant think they're their own pastor. And that's why they want to start a channel. How funny. God used a pastor here to have more subscribers than some of them. Yeah. Ain't that funny? Ain't that funny? That's God's personal joke on them, I think. Now, notice right here that, uh, right, that in this verse, that blindness, what? In part, partially, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Temporarily. Told you so, partially, temporarily. Okay, go back. Genesis 24. Genesis chapter 24. So in verse 67, we see the picture that the church takes the place of Israel. So then the first love, Israel, has been cast aside and they've been replaced. The first love has been replaced. Sarah's love had been replaced by Rebekah. That's why the last part says, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So the son is comforted after Sarah, his mother, died. The middle part, it says right here, and he loved her. Notice that verse 67, which I explain, Rebecca became his wife as soon as she was brought inside Sarah's tent, as Isaac brought her inside there. And then at that moment, the verse says Isaac loved her. Again, the picture is so obvious, Ephesians 5. It's a no-brainer, Ephesians 5. The Bible says that Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. It is very apparent that the son loves the church, loves Rebekah. Isaac loves Rebekah. Christ loves the church. Notice in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says that Christ gave himself for the church and loves him. 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Pretty apparent. Go back to Genesis 24 again. Genesis 24. Here's an extremely interesting part. Last nugget. You ready for this? This is really fun here. Isn't it interesting that in the book of Genesis, the Bible mentions Sarah's death. So naturally, who's the next woman? Rebecca, right? But Rebecca's death is not mentioned. All right, here's another one. Well, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's normal. Sometimes they won't mention some people's death. No, the next person, Rachel, has been mentioned. Rebecca's an important figure in this uh, start of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Those are the three big names when you start out with the nation of Israel. So then their wives are important, Sarah and Rachel. That's why they're mentioned. But why isn't Rebecca mentioned? Oh, how about it? So notice right here, this is fun. The Christian church, if they picture Rebecca, they don't have to die. The church doesn't have to die. The church suddenly, like Rebecca, just disappears out of the passage. Oh my. The church disappears. Like Rachel's death disappears from the passage, gets raptured. So hence we see a beautiful picture of the rapture. Isn't that interesting? 
So we see Sarah's death is mentioned at Genesis 24, 67. Rachel's death is mentioned at Genesis 35. You can turn over there or write it down however way you want to. And I'll just go ahead and read it quickly for you. Genesis chapter 35, verse 19. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. I would like to add one more interesting nugget here. In Genesis 35, it mentions Rachel's death. And then in Genesis 24, it mentions Sarah's death, mentions uh, Isaac's death. We see Isaac's death is mentioned at Genesis 35, but why isn't Rachel's death, uh, why isn't Rebecca's death mentioned? Oh, isn't that something? The son died to give us life, not just spiritually, but you could be surprised. It could be even more physical than you think. You could escape death where God himself actually did not escape death. He chose to partake death for you so that you don't have to uh, taste death. If it does so happen, we get raptured up to heaven. Isn't that something? Man. Well, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. One day I would love to dedicate, like I told you, a whole teaching just on Christian pictures in Genesis. There's so much here. There's so much. Let's go to Genesis 25. Now let's cover a little bit of uh, Muslim apologetics here. Just a little bit of that. Let's look at Genesis chapter 25 and verse 1. Then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. Abraham, he again takes himself a wife to marry. The wife's name is Keturah. So after Sarah died, Abraham wanted to remarry. He gets one. Keturah gives birth. Now, you'll notice that I wrote down, I don't know if uh, the camera can show it pretty clearly, it was a little light purple. You know, I don't know why. The pen's been too long in San Francisco Bay for too long, so I guess that's why. But anyway, it's like a light, uh, weird purple color. I hope that people can see that. That's how the descendants go uh, from Ishmael's line. Ishmael's line. So we're going to be covering Keturah as well as Ishmael's line. And the reason why they're both related is because a lot of the descendants are actually Arabic. A lot of the Arabian descendants are from these two lines, Keturah as well as Ishmael. So Genesis 25 is your chapter that can deal with the Arabic people if you're interested on their descendants or where they come from. Now, like I usually try to do, I explain each and every name. So if you're ready, get, make sure that your hand's ready because we're going to go through this, okay? I'm just going to simply read from Dr. Altman's Genesis commentary and then explain each and every name quickly. So Keturah's the new wife of Abraham. She gives birth to the children, and here are their names and their meanings. First of all, uh, we see that Keturah is mentioned. And then the next part is Zimran at verse, uh, it, actually her name is given here. Her name in Hebrew supposedly means incense, incense. Verse 2, and she bare him Zimran. So she gives birth to a son named Zimran. Zimran means celebrated, celebrated. And Jokshan, Jokshan means fowler. Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R. Now, Zimram's uh, descendants could be Zabram, west of Mecca on the Red Sea. Jokshan probably are the Kasamites of Arabia. That's K-A-S-S-A-M-I-T-E-S. -S -S -E the next person, and Medan. Medan means judgment, means judgment. Again, Arabian tribes, not too many specifics on that. And Midian. Now, Midian is very plain. We see that in future passages in the scriptures. They're undoubtedly connected somehow to Arabic, uh, Arabian descendants. Midian means contention. Contention. Dr. Rutman writes, the Arabians of Sila, Petra, and Edom. So they might have a play in the tribulation. We'll see. And Ishbak. Ishbak means free. And he's from the North Arabian tribe. Next person. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, where am I at? Okay, and Shua. Shua means 
uh, depression, depression. I know some uh, Korean or Asian names are called Shua, so that must be a depressed individual. <laughs> All right, next one. And uh, Jokshan, <laughs> and Jokshan <laughs> beget Sheba. So remember, Jokshan is mentioned at verse 2. So then Sheba is going to be the grandchild of Keturah. So Sheba means oath or covenant. Kind of like, remember, the queen of Sheba? Right. So, there's a ter so she might have some relation to that. And Dedan. Dedan means low, low. It's actually named after the grandson of Cush. Grandson of Cush, believe it or not, where Nimrod's line came from. Let's see over here. Uh, and the sons of Dedan, so now we're coming to the great-grandchildren, right? From Dedan's line. Were Ashuram. Ashuram means mighty ones, mighty ones. And Letushim, that means oppressed or struck. Oppressed or struck. And Lumim, Lumim, that means peoples, peoples. It could have some relation to some kind of Arabic tribe or Arabic, uh, Arabic wording, Ben Elam, Ben Elam. Might have some kind of historical connection there if you dig it up. Anyways, next one is, and the sons of Midian. So now we're coming to Midian's line. Remember, we covered Jokshan's line at verse 3. Now we're covering Midian's line at verse 4. So now, remember, this is the grandchildren. Ephah. Ephah means obscurity or a measure. Obscurity or a measure. And Ephah. Ephah means young deer or calf. Young deer or calf. And Hanuk. Hanuk means dedicated. Dedicated. Supposedly, Hanaki which is H-A-N-K-Y-E, north of Medina, Arabia. Next one is an Abida. Abida means father of knowledge. Father of knowledge. Supposedly, he's Iboda in Arabia. And Elda'a. Elda'a means whom God called. All these were the children of Keturah. Now, this is something important. Notice right here, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Keturah's children, unto the Arabic people, those poor Muslims that, no, that's not what it said, unto Isaac, that's the Jews. So it goes to Isaac. Everything Abraham owned and had was given to Isaac, his son, the Jewish descendants and line and lineage. But unto the sons of the concubines. Now notice your holy, uh, the Holy Spirit says concubines. The sons of the concubines. So Keturah was a concubine of Abraham. But it doesn't say one concubine. It says sons of the concubines. Then who's the other concubine Abraham married? Hagar. Oh, so we're covering Ishmael's line too. So notice that Ishmael's descendants, Keturah's descendants, which Arabic people have connections to, that the sons of those two women, Keturah and Hagar, which Abraham had, Abraham had these sons, self-explanatory, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son. So Abraham gave these uh, descendants who have connections to the Arabian people gave them gifts, but he sent them away from the Jews where Isaac, his son, was at. You know what that means? The Arabic people have no business being in the same place where those Jews are. Right. Now, the, lay, uh, the argument goes, well, we were here first, right? Then those Jews came, uh, then those Jews came and took our territory and land. Hey, man, you don't study history. You, uh, uh, this is B.C. 1857. They got first dibs thousands and thousands of years before. Yeah. So that argument don't work. Number two, they kind, of, they kind of earned it because they had no nation for over a millennia. Yeah. They suffered. They went through the Holocaust for crying out loud. Right. Now, do I approve of the th uh, ways that the Israeli government is doing things? No, as much as I don't approve of the American government or even the Republican Party of how they do things. Every government official 
has corruptions. Why? It's not God's government. Right. It's man's government. And man's government and kingdoms are ruled by Satan. Luke 4, the kingdoms of this world are given to Satan. So don't use uh, man's flaws and sins as an excuse that, well, they shouldn't be there. No, it's not a matter of based on their sins. It's a matter of what God promised and what his word said. What his word said. And don't worry about the poor people. Because when you study the politics and the depths of it, both sides suffered. Both sides have good arguments. You know what that is? That's called sin. Sin is so unfair that you're not going to get your fair privilege or your rights like you are deceived into thinking you'll get. That's why everyone plays a victimization card of, I want my privilege, I want my right, because, and then you blame it on another race. Well, that's, that's really smart. That's a very liberal thing to do. I thought that we're all supposed to uh, treat each other well. This is a world of love and toleration of all races. Not, not how I see it. Not how I see it. Not how I see it. Anyways, returning to the main text here, Abraham sent them away from Isaac, his son, where he lived, where he was at. So they have no business there. While he yet lived, so while Abraham was alive, he pushed them where? Eastward unto the east country. So then they were pushed aside. So if this is where Isaac was at, and remember, they are going eastward. This makes sense why these regions right here that you will see, that these regions right here, that the Arabic people fit very well to, these, uh, to their uh, founders or to their forefathers if you go all the way back. Because they were, uh, Ishmael's line, Keturah's line, were hitting toward this side and this side. Because if Israel's right here, then they're being pushed toward the Arabian desert or the Syrian desert. Mm -hmm. That's why you see a growing population of the Muslim uh, religion as well that was descended or originated from the Arabic people. That's why it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Now notice that this passage is very plain, that it actually specifically says that the Arabian people have no part where Isaac's place is. Now it specifically says that, look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 25. Galatians chapter 4 verse 25. Let's see what Hagar represents in the Bible. The Bible says, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in where? Arabia. Arabia. Okay, so God puts Arabians in the line right here with Hagar. What happens with her? Verse 30, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her what? Son, Ishmael's line. So notice that they're away from that place of Israel and pushed toward, uh, they're pushed out. They're pushed out. We put Egypt right here because they were going like here. They were going all over here. They were being pushed out. Uh, let me know if I'm cut off uh, from this side, okay? Anyways, am I cut off? Okay, then. Right here is good? All right. In the next part of verse 30, it says the last part, For the son of the bondwoman, Ishmael's descendants, shall not be heir with the son of the free woman, Isaac. So they have no part together. Now, you might say, well, that's unfair. Unfair? 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 Okay, let me show you something here. How small is this property? How big is this? This? Look at this big, huge, vast of swath of land, man. You can make a whole continent out of this. Unfair. Unfair. Funny, funny people. Let's go back. Let's go back. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 25. Notice that God treats everybody well. God didn't put a curse, actually, on Ishmael's line. He didn't put a curse on it. He actually uh, left them with a blessing. Yeah. But what did he want? I want you to own up to your blessing and the Jews own up to their blessing. I don't want you all covet each other's ministries. Uh-huh. Anyone getting under conviction? 
I don't want you to covet each other's callings or blessings that God has given to you and say, that's mine, it should go to me. See, that's human nature. Human nature. No different from you Christians. We all have that in our mindset. The anger is bad, wrath is bad, the scripture says, but who can stand before envy? Yeah. All right, Genesis chapter 25, and let's wrap it up. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived. So, hence the Bible is wrapping up. So everything that was recorded from Genesis about Abraham's life, the Bible says, so those are the days of Abraham's years. His entire life that has been explained how he lived his life. 100, three score, and 15 years. So that's 100, three score is three times 20. Score is 20 years for some of you who didn't know. So that's 160 and 15 years. And for some of you dunny, dummies who don't know basic math, then you go 60 plus 15, and that equals 70, 70, 175, all right? <laughs> Teasing some of you, all right? Thank God that I'm not making you draw geometry on the board and do shapes with, that, with those numbers, right? <laughs> okay, then. All right, anyways. Uh, Genesis chapter 25 and verse 7. I'm, I'm just making so much stuff up right now that just, uh, anyways, verse 8. Then Abraham, Abraham gave up the ghost. So that, that's the idea is that he died. That's a uh, metaphorical expression used in the English language that he died. He gave up the ghost. So he has his own spirit within him, his ghost within him, but it departed. It went away. It's not within him anymore. That's why he gave it up, so to speak. Right. And died in a good old age, an old man and full of years. So he died at a very good age, full of years, a satisfactory life, lived his life fully as an old man, and was gathered to his people. So then he was uh, gathered and summoned up with his people. Wow, what does that mean right here? Notice right here that when he died, notice it says his people. Now think about this. Usually some people might assume that it's referring to being buried, which could, I could possibly give an opening to that. However, it doesn't really work with this verse because Abraham's people, you have to realize, his people means his descendants, his family. Yep. Why, the only person he has so far is just Isaac. Yeah. So that don't make sense. His people would be referring back to the Ur of the Chaldees. Well, he wasn't buried over there. It wouldn't refer to uh, his family tree because then we'll have to include Ishmael and everybody else. It's more of his descendants, descendants his lineage. That's the idea of Abraham. You're going to find that throughout all the entire Bible when they say gather to his people, his people. That's referring to their culture, their lineage, their people. Why then, this ain't going to make sense because Abraham wasn't buried at his homeland. He was buried uh, at the Ur of the Chaldees. He was buried in Canaan, a foreign land where he's a stranger. What does that mean? Has a different wording then. Luke 16, Luke 16. His people, the people of God. Notice that he was gathered. What do they mean by gathered? Kind of like the angels would gather the soul, mm -hmm. carry the soul yeah. after the person dies, bring th that soul to their people. And during the timeline of the Old Testament, it was called Abraham's bosom. So Abraham's bosom, it's appropriate how it was called because Abraham gives that first indication in Scripture so then when we call Abraham's bosom, it fits him well because it's the first mention, yeah. the first mention of such a place or first indication, if we want to be fair, that's not really a mention. Luke chapter 16 and verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel, see that? Gathered into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, where is Abraham's bosom? Where, are, where is this group of people? And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Ah, so notice it's in the location where hell is. Because the rich man, the, the one who's burning in hell, sees Lazarus, who has gathered to his people, to Abraham's bosom. He's able to see him. 
but he's in torment and they're comforted. Uh, notice he can speak and communicate with them at verse 24. So Abraham's bosom is where hell's located. Verse 25, Abraham is even able to speak to lost people in hell. So it's in the same location. Verse 26 is very plain. It's in the same location. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So notice that they're in the same location together, and there's a gulf that's between them. So where Abraham died, he had to go to the place where the other people of God were at. Because remember, when Adam died, where could he go? Where could he go? So he had to go to the underworld where hell was located. But this location was a place of comfort. Some people call it paradise. Some people call it Abraham's bosom but, or the underworld. But the idea is, is that the people of God during the Old Testament, when they died, they went down there. Yeah. Well, what about the New Testament? We go up there. Yeah. We go up there. Yep. Because this is Old Testament. Jesus didn't die on the cross yet, Luke 16. And this is Old Testament reference. When you look at the New Testament, there are way too many verses that talk about we go up to heaven. Yes. So that's where people go now. Amen. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for your words where we can learn and grow in knowledge and have a greater appreciation. Uh, what an incredible book, as I've mentioned so many times. Thank you for the opportunity to go verse by verse with you as our guide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.